Thank you, Democrats. <laughs> Thank you, Democrats. I love our party and I love each and every one of you. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful warm welcome. <laughs> Democrats, what a time to be involved in South African politics. And what a time to be involved in the DA. For several elections now, we've spoken about the political change that's going to take place in South Africa. A change that we now all know is inevitable. For the past decade, we've hinted at it, predicted it, and many of us have even spoken about it. And we've spoken about the possibility of it happening in every year's election. But I can feel it in my bones and I can feel it in my political waters that this time it's different. These shifts that we're seeing today, the undeniable implosion of the ANC, the collapse of splinter parties like COPE, who were once thought of as the real contenders. We've seen the impotent and empty rage of the economic freedom fighters and the explosion of all sorts of new small parties made up of disgruntled and disillusioned South Africans. But the ANC's decline is now terminal. And the question is now, how fast? If this decline in support can be accelerated up until the election and then held there, and they, as they roll out their squeeze campaign, we will see the end of the African National Congress in 2024. What that means is that every single person in this room stands to make history next year. Democrats, we will have the privilege and the massive responsibility to be the first party in South Africa in 75 years to go from opposition into a leading role in government. And our country has not experienced this until the, uh, since the National Party won its first election all the way back in 1948. For the next 46 years, no one really challenged them in elections. And this was then followed by 29 years of uninterrupted ANC rule. Three quarters of a century of one party rule has been disastrous for our country. Because the ruling party that doesn't fear an electorate, that doesn't fear the outcome of an election, is a very dangerous beast. It acts with impunity and it turns on its people. And we saw this with both the Nats and with the ANC. But next year, Democrats, we have a chance to change that story. We have a chance to put to the test for the first time in the history of our democracy, the most fundamental aspect of our constitution, a peaceful change of government through the democratic vote of its citizens. And I hope that you all realize sitting in this conference hall today, just how big a momentous moment this is and what this responsibility places on each and every one of us in the DA. Because while there'll be many more parties on the ballot paper than ever before, it's becoming increasingly clear to everybody that this is a two horse race. Even without outright majorities, there's only one of two parties in the country that it can emerge at the center of a coalition government. And that is either the DA or the ANC. And I know which one I want, and I hope you do too. Democrats, that is the reality. That is the reality of what faces our country today. But I also need you to realize that we enter into these elections in this strong position, not by default or by some accident, 
but because some very bold decisions were taken at a time when things looked much worse for our party. And then all of us worked very hard to put ourselves in the position we find ourselves today. And just take a look around you in this conference hall. This Democrats in this hall represents the very best of South Africa. And the position that we will leave this Congress hall at the end of this weekend was not a given. Four years ago, we had just emerged from our first ever election where we had lost ground. Up until 2019, we were proud to display the DA's growth in election after election on graphs. That arrow was always pointing up to the sky and we did our calculations and we predicted where that upward arrows would be and where it would meet the ANC's downward arrow. We were buoyant and we were bold in those predictions. But then 2019 happened. And for the very first time, that graph wasn't something that we wanted to show the world. We kept up a brave face, but even internally, I know that there were some who had doubts about the future of the party. But this was nothing compared to externally. For non-DA voters and increasingly a hostile press, we were as good as dead. By the end of the 2019, following the release of our review panel report and the exit of several high profile leaders, many wasted no time in pending our obituary. Internally, however, we knew even before we had read the review panel report that our electoral problems and troubles were as a, as a result of us having become untethered from our core values and our liberal principles. We knew that in trying to dabble in identity politics and watered down aspects of policies of parties like the ANC, in an effort to try and be a bit of everything to everybody, we had given up on our very strong, very clear identity that had sustained us for decades, even through the darkest days of apartheid. And in politics, that is suicide. But externally, the problem was diagnosed very, very differently. Some in the media said that it was because we hadn't gone far enough in appropriating the ANC's stance on race and the ANC's policies on redress. And if we didn't adopt the ANC's stance, we were doomed. If only the DA could be a better ANC, it would win the elections comfortably, was the central message of the analysis. And everywhere people were writing off the DA. They were speaking about, uh, speculating about who would replace us as the official opposition, and how soon, and what the country's coalition prospects would look like once the DA had just faded away. Some were predicting even that some of the departing leaders of the DA would go on to replace the DA with their new movements and platforms and dialogues. According to Ipsos at that time, the DA was polling at just 16%. And nobody saw us coming back from that. That colleagues was the DA I inherited when I put my hand up to lead this party as the interim federal leader in October 2019. It was a party in electoral decline. It was a party that struggled to define its values. A party with no clear ideological position on just about any issue. And a party that had committed the number one cardinal sin in politics and taken voters for granted. The DA was a party at a crossroads. It could follow the advice of the external critics, or we could try to rediscover the party that we once were. And looking back now, it seems so obvious. But at the time, it wasn't so clear cut for everybody. But I knew, and so did everyone who I trusted and listened to, that the only way to resuscitate the DA and to save South Africa, the only way to get that arrow pointing up in the right direction on the graph, was by ignoring the naysayers and critics and seeking out our values. Yeah. 
We'd have to learn to grow a thick skin when it came to critique in the media and other voices outside the party. People always seemed to be so incredibly convinced and concerned about the fate of the DA, but had no intention of ever voting for us. We'd have to learn to trust our own instincts and shut out the noise from the outside because we knew there would be a lot of noise. We'd have to make a firm commitment to the core values of our party. Non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the constitution, the power of a market economy to create jobs and lift people out of poverty, and building a capable state free of corruption and cater deployment. And when I say make a commitment to these values, I mean in action, not just words. It's easy to say the word, the world that you believe in, in it's, it's easy to say to the world that you believe in non-racialism, but it's another thing to actually have the guts to stand up to the growing populist trend of racializing laws and of racializing society and re-racializing South Africa. We'd also have to learn to have the discipline to pick our battles and then remain fundamentally disciplined in all of our messaging. Now our country is facing a multitude of crises and life for the poorest of our citizens has become so incredibly hard. If we wanted the DA to be effective and relevant, we'd have to learn to pick the issues by the impact that they would have on the lives of ordinary South Africans and particularly vulnerable South Africans and then not allow ourselves to be distracted from these issues by the new cycle of that day. Now again, it's a lot easier said than done. The cut and thrust of politics, particularly in today's fast moving online social media world, is designed to put you into arguments and disputes. Before you know it, you're fighting on an issue that is nowhere near the thing that you said that you wanted to focus on. But I knew that we'd have to show incredible issue and message discipline if we wanted to make an impact and prove to South Africans that the DA is the only party fighting for the things that really matter in their lives. So that was my mission and mandate. Anchor the DA to its values amid all the noise and critique and then to keep the DA on message and on the big issues. That's how we would ultimately prove to the doubters that they were wrong, to turn the DA around and claw back all the ground we had lost, not only in the 2019 elections, but also in the subsequent years as this break in our momentum continued to affect us in by-elections. And I'm delighted to report that the most accurate polling numbers available to us indicate that we've managed to do all of this and more. Consider that in October of 2019, the DA support stood at just 17%. At that time, the ANCs were sitting at 59%. Today, our support stands at 26%, and the ANCs have fallen to around 40%. That is a massive reversal. But just as important as our support turnaround these past four years has been, the way in which the DA has consistently driven the issues that really matter has made all the difference. We've spent the past four years setting the agenda on all the biggest stories, from poverty and on the cost of living to crime and law and order. And we did so throughout a pandemic lockdown when other parties could barely operate. Wasn't that an amazing achievement, colleagues? driving on the cost of living crisis particularly managed to change the narrative in the country and to connect the seemingly unrelated dots to show what has caused food and fuel prices to spiral out of control. And I'm incredibly proud of the work done on this issue by DA structures and DA teams around the country in fighting relentlessly and single-mindedly for poor people who often found themselves powerless against wave of wave of price increase. You've shown South Africa where the DA's priorities lie. You have shown the parties where our party's heart lies. 
And I tell you, colleagues, people will not forget that. Now, of course, this fight hasn't been won yet, but we are in the ring, fighting for zero rating of food products, fighting for fuel levies to be cut, fighting for dignity for poor and hungry South Africans. Just as we were the only and first party in KZN when communities were under siege from rioters. Well done, KZN. Just as we were the only party fighting to protect South Africans from load shedding through credible, practical solutions. Well done, DA government. Just as we were the only party condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine and raising right at the beginning the impact of what this invasion would have on poverty here in South Africa on our continent. Those are fights that matter and those were our fights. They were our fights and people will not forget it. That's why it's no accident or fluke that we enter the selection campaign period in a strong position, almost 12 percentage points up from our low four years ago. We worked to be in this position. You worked to be in this position. Cheers. And I want to give particular recognition to our DA mayors and their teams around the country who are doing a phenomenal job of demonstrating the clear blue water between DA governments and those rotten administrations run by the ANC. Against this backdrop of and sea of decline and decay in ANC run towns and cities, our mayors, our MACOs, our teams, our councillors, and all other talented people in our party are demonstrating what a million words could never begin to say. Every government success achieved in these towns and cities shows the rest of South Africa what can be done under a government that cares and a government that works hard for the people of South Africa and not for the politicians. And I am delighted that we can now add the name of Mayor Salias Brink to this illustrious list. Now, he was a big loss to our DA National Caucus, but he's an even bigger gain for the people of Chwane. But I can't mention Chwane and I can't mention the other Gauteng metros without pausing for a moment on the topic of coalitions. Because this is something that's certainly going to be a big part of our election story next year. And the events of the past few years in Johannesburg and Ekuleni, and also in Chwane, have taught us some incredibly valuable lessons. Many of these lessons were around the importance of principles in coalition governments and how you can never sacrifice these principles just for the sake of power. But an equally important lesson we learned was around the composition of coalition governments. If you look at the difference between the relatively stable Chwane and per perpetually unstable Johannesburg and Erkeleni, it comes down to a number of parties represented in coalition. In Chwane, we have a majority coalition made up of just four parties. In the other Gauteng metros, we have minority governments with up to 10 parties in each. This is why our excellent chief whip in the National Assembly, Savibe Guarube, is working hard on a number of bills aimed at solving these issues around too many splinter parties disrupting coalition governments. And that has to be at the back of our mind throughout our election campaign. We don't just simply want to bring the ANC below 50%. We want to end up at the center of a coalition government that is able to serve South Africans. Now, I know this is possible. I know this party, and most of all, I know what we are capable of. So Democrats, don't listen to the naysayers if they tell you it can't be done, if they tell you that coalitions can't work. These are the same people who told you the DA was dead and buried at Keiku Lake on snow.
To quote Mark Twain from a cable he sent from London to the press in the United States after an obituary had been mistakenly published. And I quote, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated, unquote. And just as the reports of the DA's death back in 2019 turned out to be so greatly exaggerated, any reports now of writing off workable coalition governments after 2024 are equally mistaken. But as long as it is DA values, DA policies, and most importantly, DA people that sit at the heart of such coalition government, we have an excellent chance of turning South Africa around and giving the people of this country a future worth fighting for. <laughs> Democrats, it's been the singular biggest honor of my life that you bestowed upon me to lead this party over these last three years. And whatever happens today in the voting, I will cherish these three years as the greatest time of my life. And that is largely due to the fact that every single day of those last three word years, I've had the opportunity to work with all of you, side by side in the trenches, fighting the good fight, never giving up, and never stopping to fight for the people of South Africa. South Africa needs a strong DA to build a better future. Our Congress has shown them that we are ready. It's time to get out there, win those votes to build a better future. Thank you. Hello.